Um, next, we've got Peter Bradbury from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Thank you, Peter. What is engineering? Anybody? So, what is it? Solving problems. Solving problems. Anybody else? <coughs> no? Making money. Making money. Yes. I'll come, back to, I'll come back to making money in a minute. Anything else? Applied science. Applied science. Good old MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, came up with an idea that engineering is the practical application of science. So, well done. The practical application of science. The scientists come up with all these fantastic ideas which are completely useless. Until an engineer does for 50p what a scientist takes 50 quid to do. Because then you can make money out of it. Okay? Now, the previous speaker was talking about autonomous vehicles and so on. We've had autonomous aeroplanes for a long time. They still have pilots on them. I wonder why. The presentation, which we're hopefully going through here a little bit about uh, what we're going to do today, it's a bit different. What we're going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge the Royal Aeronautical Society and how that operates and how that uh, looks to the outside world with the aerospace engineering. Because aerospace engineering is a much wider concept than people sometimes think. Everybody knows what that is. Okay. There's the A380. Okay, so actually a fairly elderly aeroplane now. <laughs> okay. Um, just as a matter of interest, I am also a member of the IET. <laughs> um, because that's my essential background. So, I would, uh, so it would be interesting to see what the IET's view on this 787 is. But, let me just say an example. What are the areas of that aeroplane that the Royal Aerosoc and as engineers in general operate under. Well, there's the obvious one. And I will not give any prize out to anybody who knows what the meaning of excrescence is, if anybody can actually pronounce it. Uh, okay, you can, go, you can actually put that up on the Twitter feed if you want as to actually what it is. <laughs> so everybody can guess. But airframes. Yeah, airframe design, aerodynamics. Uh, let's throw stores out in a military context, let's throw out a weapon and see what happens as my colleague will talk about perhaps later on. What happens next? So the Royal Aeronautical Society and aeronautical engineering in general looks at airframes, it looks at aerodynamics, yes that's the one that usually appears. Flight controls, yes, navigations, navigation systems, actuators, Mostly going electrical, of course, now. Okay, and navigation systems, of course, was my, was my area at the end of the day. We also have other things like undercarriage design. Now we're into mechanics. Now I'm going to take over the mechanicals. Okay, I've already taken over the IETs. Now I'm going to take over the mechanicals. So we've now got undercarriage, ground handling, and so on. Interesting point of view, when we're dealing with simulation, the most difficult part the mathematicians have not yet done, the mathematicians haven't worked it out yet, is the transition from the ground to the air. The simulators can't do it. Aeroplanes can. <laughs> they, they, they do it naturally. <laughs> Aeroplanes can do it fine, but simulators can't do it. It's awful. It either jerks itself up or it slams down inappropriately. Okay? <coughs> so simulators on the ground are terrible things. Hydraulics. Um, I don't know which society deals with hydraulics. The mechanicals? Yeah, well, we're still pinching the mechanics. Okay. What about propulsion? I'm going to pinch the propulsion uh, uh, society's uh, <laughs> funder now. Aeronautical engineering, we also deal with fuel systems, propellers, propulsion systems. Uh, yes, I have flown aeroplanes with turbo compound engines, for those of you who come from that background. Uh, absolutely possible. Electrical systems. Electrical engineering, generation, distribution, 52% of the 787 cost is now electrical. Not structural or aerodynamics, it's electrical and the seats. Who back? Anybody here from an engineering institution that makes seats? Oh, back to the mechanicals again, damn. So, we're going to pinch their view again. 
So generation and distribution. <coughs> ah, now we're getting into now we're going into the military side. Now we're into sensors, but that's also <coughs> primary precipitative cause. Going back to the title of my presentation to start with, precipitative cause of the Air France 447 disaster in the South Atlantic. And you would like to know what the actual precipitative event was? They couldn't accurately tell how far pointing up they were from the the horizon was. Um, not quite, but close. There was a sensor failure. A simple sensor failure. <coughs> okay? It was actually a piece of crypt that's about that long, and it's in a box about that much. It costs about two and a half thousand dollars. Worse still, though, Airbus knew it would fail. Mm. So that's even worse. So we've got loads of these things. So, all, of course, we're also into pilots. Yes, the Aeronautical Society does, does deal with pilots as well. You may notice I am dressed in a rather inappropriate manner. Okay, for something of this nature. This is because this afternoon I am actually going off and doing an instrument rating flight test for someone. I'm an examiner. So I also have an input onto the pilot's aspects of it. But that's the aeroplane. You as engineers, or if you wish to become and become this, this practical apl application of science to be able to do for 50p what it takes a physicist 50 quid to do, you may think that that is what aeronautical engineering is about. The limits of the boundary. But the Royal Aeronautical Society and engineering in general has more than just that. We're also into atmospheric, turbulence, weather. The Royal Aeronautical Society, well, I'm now going to pinch the Meteorological Society's thunder. We also have weather. People in the society that deal with weather. Communications. Human factors. Okay? Whether or not we can communicate with each other. Whether or not we can work together properly. That's the biggest, one of the major problem ones. Back to autonomous. Okay? Interesting point. If you were to fly in a military aeroplane up until very recently and you flew as a passenger, you would actually face backwards. You would actually face forwards because in the event of an accident, facing backwards is safer. Now, we were talking about autonomous vehicles earlier. I'd love to know whether or not they actually face the passengers backwards. Because it's safer in the event of a crash. Okay. Interesting point. Okay, and of course we've got surface to air missiles. Yes, we do missiles as well. Anti-aircraft systems, radio navigation aids, GPS, and so on. Ground vehicles, manned and autonomous. Okay and so on, radar and store. So you can see that we as engineers okay, in aerospace deal with a hell of a lot more than just that little aeroplane that taxis out at 3 o'clock in the morning. So we end up, this is a technical bit, there has to be a little bit of a technical bit in a topic like this. Um, we can deal with a whole series of simulation models and we were talking about simulation before. Okay, where We've got lots of inputs, lots of outputs, okay? That's what engineering is about. Taking an input, massaging it, dealing with it, producing an output, that will make money, okay? Let's be quite clear about this. Everybody loves this idea, and we'll talk about safety in a minute, because that's the topic of my talk to a certain extent. Everybody says safety is fantastic. Um, come on to that in a second. <laughs> okay. Just let me pause to have a read at that. The reason we are slightly different is if our autonomous autonomous vehicle goes wrong, <laughs> I can get out. And I'll disappear, call a taxi. Another autonomous taxi now. Or perhaps the autonomous vehicle will actually call the taxi for me. Um, in the air it's a slightly more difficult problem it's very difficult to open the door and get out and call a taxi. <laughs> okay? It's rather difficult. Uh, I love the bit where it says, learn to fly. <laughs> I love the title where it says, learn to fly there. Um, 
and I'm afraid um, automated aeroplanes doing automated landings I'm just going to come out of this I'm sorry about that just going to come out of that for a second I've just realized I didn't I did it wrong come on there we go sorry about that um, automated aeroplanes don't always work this is the most automated aeroplane currently in production doing an automated landing okay. um, I'm not convinced that me in the back would be particularly keen on that um, so airline this is a common one talking about safety and why um, part of the talk that I was trying to get to is why aviation or aerospace engineering is not benign where it's safety comes first or so they say why it's one of the most challenging areas because you can't get a stop and get out do you think that's true anybody hands up who thinks that's true okay one two come on be honest if, uh, particularly those of you who are behind the camera <laughs> you can admit to it <laughs> no so no apart from two or three nobody thinks that safety is the number one priority for an airline mm -hmm. think of hey they're just saying this it's quite i like this this is good <laughs> no i best agree with it either what's the number one priority of every, any airline Profit. making Profit. money, money. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. If, if I came up to an airline as an engineer and said, I can guarantee you will never, ever, ever have an accident if you implement my system, the airline would go, fantastic. Brilliant. And then I say, oh, by the way, it's cost you a billion dollars a year. What do you think they'll do then? Mm. They'll say goodbye. And this is not just a peculiarity of me. Okay? Aviation is full of examples of this type. The R101 airship. Those of you who are of a certain age, the DC-10 cargo door. The 747 cargo door. Okay? Anybody flying on 747s recently here? There is a significant defect in the cargo door. They're not going to fix it, because to do so would cost them too much money. So they put in layers of controls to prevent it happening. Or they think they'll prevent it from happening. So in this airline, safety is first. One of my previous speakers talked about NASA. About all the layers of controls that you put into a NASA product. Okay? Because we're really talking about products now, aren't we? So we have got an origin of start. T minus 21 seconds. And the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And lift off. is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. 
this morning it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. I show that because, it, that, as I said before, aviation is about safety. It's about being able to prevent that. The Royal Commission, not the Royal Commission, the Presidential Commission of Inquiry into that, there was a gentleman known as Feynman. Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist. He was also a bit of a radical. Okay? But he produced at the end, of, he produced a report of his own because he disagreed with the way the Presidential Commission operated. And he put at the end of that, um, in any emerging technology, okay, engineering must take precedence over public relations because nature cannot be fooled. Your job as engineers, hopefully those of you who are already in the industry and already okay, or want to come into engineering, so it's exciting. Aviation is exciting. It generates some exciting probabilities and some exciting possibilities for you. But that is its outcome if, you're not, if you allow public relations to overcome engineering and science. So your job as an engineer okay, is to not let the politicians, not let the salesmen, not let the publicists and the marketing guys get away with that. When asked the manager what the likelihood of a shuttle failure was, the manager said one in every 100,000 flights. These are the managers. One in every 100,000 flights. That's a shuttle launch for 300 years before they get a failure. Shuttle launch every day for 300 years. When the engineers were asked, behind closed doors, without the managers present, what their estimate of the failure was, one in a hundred. Okay? Public relations. It's exciting. Engineering is fantastic. Okay? You can generate fantastic products that really change the world. But, <laughs> okay? You mustn't let the marketing people, etc., do that. <laughs> Any questions? I have five, five minutes or so for questions. Look at that, I'm bang on time. <laughs> Any questions that anybody would like to ask? Anything at all about engineering? No, oh, by the way, that was, the loss of that was caused by the loss of a five dollar rubber O-ring. Which they knew was faulty. And had been known ever since the shuttle first flew. Any questions? Oh, look, stone silence! <laughs> <coughs> uh, yes? So, you showed the, the picture of the pl automated plan landing and bouncing all over the place. What, what's the key barrier there, stopping us automating that this part of the flight? The myriad of variations that was caused uh, most of these accidents to automated aeroplanes are not uh, down to the um, an engineer deciding not to do it right. <laughs> or, and actually, to be fair, they're not down to the, um, the marketing people or the accounts people getting down to say it's going to cost less. It's due to a, varied, a myriad of inputs that are never considered. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of, what really, of, of that sort of thing. A friend of mine, flight captain, senior training captain on a Boeing 777, arrives in New York, opens up the front door, man gets in, and a, and a, and a mechanic gets on board. And Stuart looks at him and says, what are you doing here? He says, oh, come to replace your fuel pump. What fuel pump? 
What had happened, of course, was that the aeroplane had detected the failure of the fuel pump, had radioed ahead, ordered a new fuel pump, okay? The mechanic had brought the fuel pump on, but had failed to tell the flight crew. Who decided not to tell the flight crew? The software engineer who designed the system. But the problem was, and that's that problem, going back to your question, <coughs> the myriad of different circumstances in which the knowledge of whether that fuel pump would work or not is important and hadn't been considered by that software engineer. That entered a zone which the software engineer had never thought about. Okay? Which, I'm not a Luddite, well I don't think I'm a Luddite, that's the problem I have with automated cars. <laughs> okay? That you can get into, because I've seen it in aeroplanes, you can get into an area, and this is what you as engineers, the up and coming engineering generation has to cope with, that's what it's about, coming up to all of those little corners that the engineers didn't think about. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So, you start really uh, desperating that Commercial airlines, they've never said yet. Sorry, Charles, I couldn't hear. So I'm, I, I hear you. Yeah, you sound like really desperating that the commercial airlines, they never put safety at first place. Absolutely. Uh, but the money. So, as engineers, how we can solve this problem, as it's pretty commonplace, as what you mentioned. So, so what do you have to do? You have to. Solution. Uh, you have to engineer the safety in from day one. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, a good friend of mine who designs um, missiles in America, actually said, he, you can imagine it, designing safety into a missile system. How do you design safety into a military missile system? <laughs> but he says, what you have to do, because you don't want it exploding on the launch pad or, or exploding under the wing of the airplane or whatever, is to design it in at the beginning so that the people who are involved in that don't know you're doing it. And I assure you as engineers, that's a really good trick. That's the exciting bit. Because <laughs> right? you have to do it. Morally, you have to do it. Any more? Yes? So you know how like automated um, landing is like pretty bad? It's like, is there going to be like any research? In, like, in oh no, I didn't say it was pretty bad. 99,999 times out of 10,000, it's perfect. But every so often, a combination of circumstances arrives that the original engineers didn't think of. And if the pilot isn't there to deal with it, that's what you get. <laughs> Let's take a straw poll. Hands up, who would get on board an A320 aeroplane knowing there was no flight crew? Bearing in mind that the Air France 447 crashed in the south of France, despite that there was flight crew on there. Yeah, two. Yeah. Would you now, let's redo, you now get on board an aeroplane that has no flight crew and has the seats facing backwards. Because when you take off, of course, you end up doing that in the seatbelt. Uh, one. We're down to one. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? All right. You as engineers have to change that perception. Yes. Um, you said about um, designing software that can account for <coughs> unpredicted variables. Um, can you then model uh, software responses based on human? Responses. Yes. Given the there are elements of that. There are elements of those research in being undertaken on that neural net type of uh, adaptive neural networks and so on. That is happening. But if the people who are dealing with it and who are trained, these neural network systems are trained. They're not programmed. They're trained. Um, if they don't train the neural network <laughs> to even think about it, it's more difficult. It's not impossible, it's more difficult. That is going on, that research is going on. 
Okay. Any others? That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.